so much crime, not only here, but in every part of the world. We have now held crusades in nearly a hundred countries, and we have traveled all these 50 years, and we've seen every ethnic group that you can think of, and every linguistic group, and had every kind of experience that you can imagine. I've been trying to write them down in memoirs. I've almost given up because it would take 15 volumes to tell everything we'd like to say. But the publishers want it in one volume. So I'm going to have to leave out about 90% of what I would like to say if we do it. But there was an article this morning that caught my attention in the Pioneer Press in St. Paul. It's dated Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. It says a 14-year-old boy, influenced by a horror film that he saw at least 10 times, killed and skinned a playmate, then cooked him according to a warlock recipe in order to learn how to fly. The crime horrified a Saskatoon town. If convicted of first-degree murder, the teen faces a life sentence. Now, can this crusade have an impact on people like that? Yes, I believe it can. I believe it's already having an impact. And I want to thank especially the newspapers, the media, for all that they have done and prepared the way. And I want to thank all the churches, a thousand churches, and the people that have held prayer meetings, because this crusade is going to be successful only as we pray. And I believe God is going to answer prayer and is already answering prayer with people finding Christ. Those of you that are watching by television, or will see it in some months from now, may not know that the city of St. Paul was named after the Apostle Paul. There was a Catholic father that came here, built a log chapel dedicated to St. Paul. And the area that now bears that name was made the capital of this state. And when Minnesota was admitted to the Union in 1885-58, St. Paul became its permanent capital. The head office of our organization is here in Minneapolis on the corner of Hennepin Avenue, which was named after Franciscan missionary Father Luis Hennepin, who visited this area in 1680. Now, people have asked many times since I've been here this past week, why haven't you come earlier? It's been many years since you've been here for a crusade. And we've always wanted to. We've talked about it and prayed about it. But somehow, this seemed to be the moment that God would have us to come. And I've had a wonderful time in these last few days. I spent last week at the Mayo Clinic getting clearance to come from them. I already had it from the Lord. <laughs> now we see the church burnings going on throughout the country, in the South especially, and we're all concerned about it, we're all praying about it. I sent uh, uh, facts to some of those churches and told them that we were praying, that we were going to try to help them financially. And uh, President Clinton read my entire statement at one of his speeches last week in a southern city. And we need to pray for those people. And let's pray that it'll stop because of all things, we don't want to burn the churches because the church is the one place we can meet together. One of the most critical elections 
since World War II is now being held in Russia. And many people are asking the question, is the old Soviet Union going to come back into existence? Is communism going to come back to much of the world? What does the future hold? We thought as we stood on the edge of the 2000, the beginning of a new year and a new century, that all of our problems would be solved. But they haven't been. The old problems that have been there all along, festering in the hearts of people, are rearing their heads, whether it be in crime or whether it be in wars. And there's so much suffering in the world. People are hurting. Disease and poverty and war and hate. Racism, loneliness, boredom, psychological problems, unemployment, AIDS, murder statistics, divorce, suicide. This is everywhere and this has been in the human heart since the days of Adam and Eve. It went on centuries ago and it's still going on. And with all of our modern technology, we haven't solved those problems. President Yeltsin stated that the whole world could be standing unknowingly at the edge of the abyss. And we might be. But we know that as believers in Christ, what the future holds. Former President Carter said some time ago that the Carter Center is monitoring 112 conflicts around the globe including 32 small, major wars, of which the conflict in Bosnia has been just one. And there are millions of people tonight that are crying out, the bottom has dropped out of my world. Suicide is on the increase, but suicide is no solution. Because you see, you have a you're a body, but you're also a soul, and your soul, your spirit, is the real you, and that's the part of you that's going to live forever. And you can't kill it. The moment you were born, you were born to, not my words, they're the words of Jesus. Cliff and I were in New Zealand some years ago, and I'd spoken at the university. And a student came to our little hotel room that night and knocked on the door, and he was very upset. And he said, why would you come and mention hell to a group like us? We're intellectuals. We don't believe in those things. I said, well, I said, Jesus said it, not me. It's all the way, it's taught all the way through the Bible. Whatever you believe about it, there is a place, there is a future toward which you will be separated from God and all that's good and all that's great in the world you'll be separated from and that's called hell. I said, I want to ask you a question. Suppose you went out here to the airport and you said that you wanted to take a plane from Auckland to Sydney about a two or three hour plane trip I said, would you get on the plane if they told you that there was a 15 or 20 percent chance that the plane would not make it? He said, no, I wouldn't. I said, would you do it if there was 15 percent or 10 percent or 5 percent? He said, no, I wouldn't get on it. I said, well, suppose there's just a 5 percent chance that Jesus was right, that there is such a thing called hell. I said, is it worth taking the risk? He scratched his head. He said, no, it's not. But he said, that's not my problem. My problem is, I can't live up to the teachings of Jesus. None of us can. I can't live up to his teachings. I have to have help. Help 
by the Holy Spirit because the moment you receive him here tonight into your heart in a new way, the Spirit of God comes into your heart and helps you to live a life that you have found impossible to live. You won't be perfect, but you'll be headed in the right direction. And you'll sense the presence of Christ in your heart. And he will produce in your heart love and joy and peace and long-suffering. You see, when Jesus Christ died on that cross, he died in your place. He took all the death and all the hell that you would ever have to endure, he took on that cross. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, the scripture says. Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. The Bible says he was made to be sin for us. You remember on the cross when he said, Lord, why have you forsaken me? The reason God forsook him and could not look was because Jesus was sin. He was made to be sin. He had all of your sins on him. All of our adulteries, all of our fornications, all of our lusts, all of our murders, all of our hate, all of our prejudice, all of our lying, all of our stealing, all of our cheating, all of our fraud was laid on him. And God cannot look upon evil. He couldn't even look upon his own son. And the people down there began to make fun of him and says, if you are the Jesus, the Christ, the, why don't you come down from the cross? If he'd come down from the cross, you and I would never have had an opportunity to go to heaven. But that wasn't the end of it. He was buried. They took him and put him in a tomb. He had said earlier, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I'm not going to suffer eternal death. Jesus has already done it for me. And the scripture says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Do you want to be saved tonight? Do you want to know it? Do you want to know if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven? Do you want to have Christ living in you tonight from this moment on? And you have the privilege of fellowship with him day by day and he will help you in the decisions you have to make.